Creating a wetland like this is not cheap and it's not something we could do on our own. Put in a snake hibernaculum, approximately an eight foot deep hole, uh, about eight feet in diameter, and that was filled with uh, concrete, uh, cinder blocks, a lot of other debris. Hi everyone, my name's Ranger M and I work at Catfish Creek Conservation Authority. I'm the community outreach technician and that means I do a lot of this, chatting about all things nature and conservation with kids, adults, teachers, everyone. I love to knowledge share and that's just what I'm gonna do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. So Scott, when we were talking last time, uh, you mentioned you had this beautiful big property and you've actually done a lot of rehab work on it. And I would love it if you could show us some of your projects here. Yeah, I'd be happy to show you around and tell you a bit about it. Okay, awesome, let's head out. So can you give us an overview of your property and kind of what you've done here? Yeah, well, it's a 55 acre property and you know, about 10 years to find the perfect property. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that we liked about this area is that it was partly provincially significant wetland and partly an area of natural and scientific interest. So it had a certain amount of protections already, though there were a number of fields that were used for agriculture and we wanted to renaturalize those spots. So everything from creating brush piles to wetlands to removing non-native species, digging vernal pools. We've tried to look at um, many ways to enhance the property, to revert it back to nature and make it as useful to wildlife as possible. So what will we come across first? Well, I think as we're walking, uh, you may see you know, some small brush piles along the way. Uh, and as we get closer to the field, uh, we've created a large vernal pool on the side of the trail. So I see that you have a trail cam. Do you spot a lot of wildlife? Yeah, so we installed quite a few trail cams in various areas of the woodlot in order just to see what was on the property. And we've had some pretty amazing encounters of uh, coyote going after uh, a, a raccoon and, and pileated uh, and ruffed grouse and all kinds of things on these cameras. So a really good way to have a sneak peek at what's going on behind the scenes. How many species have you seen or logged? Well, we uh, have just over 140 species of birds that we've documented this past year awesome. and uh, quite a few mammals, a uh, few reptiles, amphibians, uh, you know the the list is growing every time we go out and I have an, uh, a growing interest in, in botany as well so we're trying to document all the plant species on the property as oh, well. Oh very neat and that will be really cool because you know your practices you're implementing you'll be able to see if there's an increase you're seeing new species rare species or even species at risk on your property because of maybe some of the things you've implemented yeah exactly and and you know, if we just focused on the animal uh you know we wouldn't know enough about the habitat and i think it all uh, intertwines so what are you going to show us here scott well, when we bought the property, we saw that there was a lot of wetland habitat in the forest, so swamp. Uh, however, on drier years, we saw that that water uh, basically disappeared very quickly. So in order to provide benefit for uh, amphibians that breed in wetland pools, uh, we wanted to create uh, water that would last a little bit longer. So we started to dig vernal pools in some of these uh, woodland areas. And a vernal pool is basically a temporary wetland that lasts long enough for amphibians such as frogs and salamanders to have their eggs develop into tadpoles or larvae and then morph into uh, young individuals uh, back on the land. So we uh, were able to uh, find a few spots that were already low, would hold a certain amount of water, and we deepened those areas. So uh, we added another two uh, to three feet of, of depth, and so those will hold water long into the summer uh, in order for the amphibians to uh, successfully uh, morph into young individuals. Did you know infrastructure like old wells and building foundations, along with natural features like ant mounds and rodent burrows, are all examples of snake hibernation sites? Did you know infrastructure like old wells and building foundations, along with natural features like ant mounds and rodent burrows, are all examples of snake hibernation sites? Okay, Scott, we can obviously tell that we've reached a pretty pinnacle area in your property. Tell us what we have here. Okay, well, this is a, a retired farm field 
and we wanted to do a few things to uh, improve it for wildlife. And one of those things was to put in a snake hibernaculum. And basically what that is is a place that snakes can go down below the frost line to survive the winter. And uh, you can see first there's a big pile of brush here. And that's not the main hibernaculum, but that is an area uh, that the snakes will be able to use when they emerge from, from the hibernaculum. Uh, but the main hibernaculum is, is actually hidden under the snow. So you can see a few of the rocks here. And uh, it extends quite a ways up. So that was, uh, the area was approximately an eight foot deep hole, uh, about eight feet in diameter. And that was filled with uh, concrete, uh, cinder blocks, a lot of other debris uh, that would basically stabilize the hole and allow a lot of little crevices for the snakes to get down below the frost line. Uh, you need it deep enough, obviously, to get below the frost line. And if you can uh, match it up with your water table, uh, it will allow for a certain amount of uh, you know, water condensation to uh, develop so the snakes don't dehydrate over the winter. Okay. Yeah, and so what we did uh, in, on top of all of the uh, concrete debris is put uh, large field stones. And so that will act as a heat sink. So in the spring and in the fall, uh, when the snakes first go in in the fall and when they first come out in the spring, uh, the radiant heat, uh, you know, so the heat absorbed by the rocks, uh, will provide a good basking opportunity for all of these snakes. And the uh, small crevices between the rocks will allow protection from predators, as well as the large brush pile that we've created. Uh, so when developing these things, you want to ensure that there's multiple access points. So uh, not only are there cinder blocks uh, placed down like a ramp into the deeper area of the hibernaculum, there's also plastic tubes uh, with a number of holes drilled in the side. So there's various access points that the snakes can retreat to uh, and climb out of at different points during the, the winter and spring. Uh, why that's important is at different times of the winter, the snakes may want to uh, move up or down in the chambers of the hibernaculum to get to that sweet spot of temperature. Generally around four degrees is where it's probably safe for them to stay at. They aren't using up their fat reserves uh, to staying cold enough, uh, but it's not too warm uh, that, again, they would use up their fat reserves, uh, not too cold that they would freeze to death. So uh, very important to have a lot of opportunities for the snakes to find their microclimate or microhabitat. Okay, so what kind of snakes do you find in this hibernaculum? Yeah, on the property, we found primarily eastern garter snake and northern brown snake. Though on neighbors' properties, uh, there have been uh, northern red-bellied snake, eastern milk snake, and there is a, a very old record or a few old records from the 1940s and before of the threatened well, uh, eastern hognose snake. And so we're hoping that the eastern <laughs> hognose snake uh, is still here. Uh, we won't hold our breath. Uh, hognose snakes, though, wouldn't really use this type of hibernaculum. Uh, they bury down into a sandy area. Uh, but our uh, eastern garter snake, northern brown snake, uh, and eastern milk snake would all use a hibernaculum like and this. And they're all good and happy in there together? Yeah, absolutely. They would uh, use this communally. Uh, however, uh, milk snakes are known to sometimes eat other snakes. Oh. <laughs> uh, however, during a cold fall, winter, and, and early spring, they're not going to be feeding, and we'll find those types of uh, species together. Now, can you kind of talk about this brush pile and the long line of brush you have going into the forest? What we've done in this area, obviously, you can see the wetland behind me, we've created a, a wetland and that left a lot of the spoil piles uh, placed here. And so those were devoid of any vegetation. So it's actually quite dangerous for a snake to move over land without any protection. Uh, so until that vegetation grows up, we wanted to ensure that there were safe areas for the snakes. So uh, even once vegetation grows up, uh, brush piles are very important for snakes. It provides uh, movement corridors as well as habitat for their prey items such as mice. So this large brush pile is directly beside the rock hibernaculum. But further on, we also have a smaller brush pile that we want to extend to the woodlot. And that will provide a safe access point until the vegetation grows up next spring. Did you know 17 species of snakes call Ontario home? Did you know 17 species of snakes call Ontario home? Snakes will do anything to avoid humans through camouflage, climbing trees, or even living in water. But when that doesn't work, they have some pretty cool tactics to scare us away. Milk snakes will vibrate their tails to appear and even sound like a rattlesnake. Eastern hognose snakes have the ability to flatten their necks to look like a cobra. And if that doesn't work, they really dive into their acting skills and play dead. 
So that's really neat hearing about the way snakes hibernate. And obviously behind us is another big structure. Can you tell us about your wetland and kind of the process it was to put it into your property? First I'll start about why we felt the need for a wetland on the property. Uh, again, it had a lot of ephemeral swamp, so temporary wetland in the swamp, but it had no uh, or very little permanent water on the property. So there's a, a couple of small ponds, uh, but, but very tiny. And this large field, again, we wanted to incorporate a lot of habitat features. But it was this wetland which will be a focal point for a lot of wildlife species. So during the hottest part of the summer, uh, there will be an opportunity for uh, birds, for reptiles, amphibians, uh, mammals, all to use this, this permanent water feature. It was a bit of a challenge to um, see how this would work financially. Uh, you know, creating a wetland like this is not cheap and it's not something we could do on our own. Uh, obviously we contributed uh, a certain amount of money for the wetland, but we also had partners through the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority, Clean Water Program, Ducks Unlimited, and others all stepped up to find funding. So, uh, you know, many thousands of dollars later, uh, we now have the beginnings of this wetland. And, and when I say beginnings, it's because the hole in the ground and the water is just the beginning. It's the vegetation that needs to uh, come in and then the wildlife. And you get your um, beneficial bacteria in the water and, and your plants in the water and all of that will eventually create a, a very uh, biodiverse and, and useful wetland. Uh, however, for the process, this is a, a groundwater fed uh, wetland. This is not a surface water wetland. We realized very quickly that we had a thin layer of topsoil and the rest was pure sand. So if you know anything about sand, you pour water in and it drains away. We so, did just learn about sand, so. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's not the greatest for holding water. We did not have a clay base or, or, or a really wet uh, organic base. So we knew that we had to either reach groundwater or not have a wetland. And so that worked fine on the lower end, about a meter down, we were able to hit water. Uh, however, it was a bit of a hill. So you can see in the area, there's these large hills. Uh, this was all flat ground before, and those large hills were uh, the spoil piles or the substrate taken out of the wetland. However, what that has provided is a new and unique uh, feature and a new type of habitat for the area. Uh, we have these rolling hills. Uh, it'll create microclimates, uh, different uh, moisture regimes. And um, when you get down into the wetland, again, it's a new type of habitat. So uh, all of this together will, I think, increase biodiversity significantly. And what we're doing in order to renaturalize this area uh, to make it again more useful to native wildlife is to plant native plants. So uh, it might be a little hard to see with the snow, but there's a number of plugs. Uh, this grass here, the savanna grass, uh, was one of our bigger plugs, but we have hundreds of small plugs of native plants that were donated to us by many individuals across Ontario. If you want to attract the most native wildlife uh, by planting native plant species, that's probably your quickest way to do so. And, and I think that's something everybody needs to think about. Instead of planting that um, Norway maple or that Japanese maple, maybe look at what our native species have to offer your property. Can you touch on that structure on the far side of your wetland? The structure that you see on the other side of the wetland is actually straw bales uh, staked along the shoreline. And there's a couple layers of those straw bales and stakes, and that is uh, basically bioengineering for erosion control. We realized pretty quickly that when you put a lot of soil up on a big hill and you get a lot of rain, uh, eventually that soil ends up back in your wetland. So we didn't want to uh, you know, have all that work for nothing. So we uh, talked to a number of folks, uh, including uh, Brad Glasman at the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority, who's an engineer and told us uh, you know, a few ideas of what we can do to prevent erosion. So in addition to uh, stopping the erosion coming down the hills, uh, we wanted to stabilize the soil as well. So you can't see it now, but if we were to dig down, we would find oats that are about this tall. So the wetland was put in in September and we seeded uh, a lot of the open bare ground with oats and oats germinate very quickly. Uh, they can survive in pretty cold weather uh, and they will, the root systems will stabilize the soil and the plant themselves will stop uh, you know, active erosions from coming down. But the good thing about oats is that they will die off over the winter. The roots will still hold soil in place and by spring they won't interfere with native plants coming up. Oh 
is very neat. And then finally, I have another question for about your wetland is obviously that, that you have trees in your pond. What are those for? When we first designed the wetland, we wanted to ensure that there were opportunities for various wildlife. And of course, being a reptile biologist or herpetologist, <laughs> uh, turtles, snakes were a big part of uh, what I wanted to benefit from this. So. Uh, the trees will provide basking opportunities uh, for turtles and the submerged portion will provide habitat for a number of species. So uh, looking at this wetland and, and the plants that we've decided to put in the area and the features created, we want to have uh, waterfowl, we want to have shorebirds, we want to have reptiles, amphibians, and we are doubtful that we're going to put any fish in or at least any fish that would attack uh, amphibian eggs. So this should be an extremely beneficial spot for amphibians and we are hoping for many many thousands of frogs uh, using this habitat. Well that's really amazing it sounds like you created such a structure and ecosystem that you're going to have a very happy habitat and ecosystem cycle that there's going to be so many frogs for the migratory birds and the shoreline birds to eat and the turtles to clean it all up afterwards and everything like that that it'll just be a perfect ecosystem especially that you can just observe grow and become a better ecosystem and a better part of southwestern ontario overall exactly it's it's a miniature version of a of of the ecosystem that we want to uh, see across southwestern ontario and unfortunately in a lot of areas uh, weren't able to do that and you know it's nothing against farmers we need farms we need to eat but we also need green spaces and natural areas and connected natural areas uh, for uh, the overall benefit of not only wildlife but uh, humans too because as soon as we start fracturing our ecosystem to a point where uh, species start to decline and habitats start to fail it will ultimately inf impact our water quality and uh, just our way of life in general. And I know another main benefit of wetlands and that will help with something that's becoming more and more prevalent today is with flood control. Exactly and you know I think one of the reasons that this property was still intact uh, was because it was swamp, it was hard to farm, uh, it was hard to develop, and so it was left here. So we're lucky for that because it does provide uh, flood control. It is a giant sponge, so when water levels come up, there's a place for that to be drawn into. And if we can increase these wet habitats, uh, you know, again, like you said, the betterment uh, for flood control and people. All right, Scott, I know you have a pollinator garden on your property. I would really love to see that. Would you mind showing us? Yeah, let's go do that. Did you know in parts of southwestern Ontario, over 90% of the area's original wetlands are unfortunately gone? Did you know in parts of southwestern Ontario, over 90% of the area's original wetlands are unfortunately gone? These rates of loss are among the highest recorded anywhere on earth. Okay, Scott, so this is your garden, obviously. Can you tell us a little bit about it? How big it is, how easy, hard? Any tips or tricks for putting in a pollinator garden? Yeah, sure. So this uh, front field was uh, historically used for hay production and uh, we wanted to provide a pollinator garden or pollinator field uh, to allow for uh, not only you know bees and, and wasps but also a lot of our butterflies, moths and a lot of our grassland birds, snakes, frogs, everything has been using it and so we are slowly uh, increasing the amount of native species. Initially we just allowed the field to go fallow and that was enough to um, have a, a number of wildflowers sprout up though there were a lot of invasive and non-native species in that mix and we're slowly uh, taking them out replacing them with native species however right away uh, you know we had a large number of pollinators come in so it's been very exciting to see how this process has started and in all honesty it's been relatively hands-off uh, nature has kind of taken over um, but you do need to maintain and get rid of some of the non-natives that are overtaking the native species. Um, though there are some uh, non-native flowers that aren't too invasive that are still beneficial to insects, so we're leaving them to the last uh, before replacing them. This front field is approximately uh, two acres or so, maybe a bit, bit over two acres, uh, providing us a pretty good opportunity to create a big habitat. Also in your front property here you have another pond. Um, is this one you built as well or is this a natural one or a the previous owner did put this one in i think they needed uh some of the uh um, substrate from that to do some of the other work that needed to be done on the property and that uh you know inevitably ended up being a nice small pond in the front and it is 
uh, heavily used by amphibians, which is great. Uh, there are some fish in there, and uh, a lot of uh, shorebirds uh, use it. Uh, herons uh, quite often can be found uh, looking for frogs in the pond. But there are some problems associated with this pond, unfortunately. And uh, one of the biggest is the non-native European reed, or Phragmites australis. And it is one of the most invasive plants in southern Ontario right now, which will completely destroy um, littoral zones or shallow wetland areas. And you'll see it in ditches, you'll see it in um, swamps, you'll see it in marshes, uh, and in ponds as well. And it will overtake native species to such an extent that uh, not only do native plant species not grow, but even uh, animals such as turtles uh, cannot get through the thick bamboo-like structures of this reed. So you have a very small amount of Phragmites here on your property. What did you do to uh, try and eradicate it from your property? Initially, uh, we had to spray it, and I'm not a massive fan of spraying anything with chemicals, uh, but we realized pretty quickly if this plant is cut or if you try to pull it out and a root breaks, uh, more of the plant will grow up. And uh, by cutting it, you allow sunlight into the area and it will come back even thicker. So we did use a minimal amount of uh, herbicide and we put it directly on the plant itself so it didn't impact anything around it. And uh, then after about three weeks, uh, we cut. So this patch was actually quite a bit larger than what you'll see today. Uh, and we still have to cut down the area right along the edge of the wetland. Um, so this is gonna be a work in progress. Any sprouts uh, that do come up in the future, we will treat, but we will use um, uh, basically a, a cotton glove so that uh, herbicide does not drip anywhere else and we cannot do it over water so we'll have to find a new strategy in areas where uh, the water and the plant are in the same spot so for now uh, we are controlling it and it's the best way to um, get rid of it that we know until maybe some sort of biocontrol can be figured out which they are working on uh, which might be an insect that will kill the plant from Europe but as soon as you start uh, introducing uh, species uh, from other places to take care of species from other places. There could be problems, but we'll see what happens in the future. For now, we've had some success. So just before we wrap up, Scott, I do have a question. Um, since this is your personal land, is there any tips you can share with people about how to do this, maybe in a financially feasible way, um, or what's the easiest thing for a landowner who has maybe a spare acre or two to put towards habitat uh, rehabilitation. You know, when we started doing this, we didn't have a lot of money left over after buying the property. So it was allowing uh, maybe a field to go fallow initially and to see what pops up uh, from the start. You can look at finding uh, other people that have an interest uh, such as yourself to do a cleanup on your property, whether it's a naturalist group or, or a similar type of group. And you can also look at opportunities through uh, your local conservation authority for a cost sharing program for trees uh, and or uh, for funding for wetland creation. You told us all about species at risk last time and now you really filled us in on habitat restoration, on a personal landowner perspective and this has just been amazing and I want to thank you for letting us know what you have done to your property and possible ideas for other people to implement on their properties. Okay, great, happy to be a part of it and uh, thanks for having me on. All right everyone, thanks for joining me and I'll see you in nature. <laughs>